Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integrated Analytics to Power Critical Utility Operations, presented by Silver Spring Networks. I'm Barbara London, Editor-in-Chief of Smart Grid News, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Charles Fisher, Director of Business Development, Silver Spring Networks, Craig Cramian, Director of AMI Development, Commonwealth Edison, and Mike Madrazo, Vice President of Analytics Product Management, Silver Spring Networks. You can read our speakers' full bios on the right side of your screen. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you have trouble reading a slide, please hold and drag the right-hand corner of the slide window to enlarge. Please also disable your pop-up blocker to participate in the interactive parts of this presentation. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the purple globe at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. The presentations will be followed by a question and answer session. Please submit your questions during or after the presentations using the Q&A box at the right of your window. Okay, let's begin. Charles, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, so as, uh, as stated in the title, uh, we are here to talk today through the SSN approach to big data analytics, as well as talk through a specific use case uh, where we've taken uh, a specific business use case from uh, analysis to, to operational, uh, an operational process. So today we're going to talk through our, uh, our challenges that we're seeing currently with our customers as we're moving from are currently with the industry as we're moving from deployment of these large-scale geographic networks to uh, doing something with the analytics and the data that's coming out of them. We're going to talk through our, our approach to this as we're working with our customers through these challenges, and then uh, specifically talk through a ComEd use case uh, around transformer mapping for meters, and talk through how we started uh, with analysis and analyzing this particular problem and moving it into an actual operational day-to-day uh, day uh, day -day working model. Uh, and after that, we'll follow up with the Q&A session for the, uh, for the group on the, on the call here. So as mentioned, today's speakers are myself, Charles Fisher, Director of Business Development for Software and Analytics at Silver Spring Networks. Uh, I'll be introducing uh, the topic and our approach, and then I'm going to pass it to Mike Madrazo, uh, Vice President of Analytics, uh, to talk through our, uh, our solution, our specific solution, as well as Craig Cramian from, from ComEd to provide uh, customer context. So to start with, uh, I'd like to talk through just Silver Spring Networks briefly and introduce the company to those of you that uh, may or may not be, be familiar. So uh, Silver Spring Networks is a network platform company. The uh, majority of our business to date has been in the uh, electric metering, electric AMI. Um, we are moving into other parallel use cases and in industries such as water, gas, uh, endpoints, uh, smart cities and street lights and other IoT applications. Uh, we currently have a, an open partner ecosystem that is a core or a key tenant of, of our platform, uh, both open on the device end as well as open on the software end for, uh, for an ecosystem of partners. We have 125 plus partners. That on the device side is across, as I said, water, gas, and electric before, smart cities, uh, distribution automation devices, and then the software end on providers that would do something with that data, uh, energy efficiency, um, distributed generation, demand response, uh, grid operations, so on and so forth. Um, so the key, uh, the key component here is open on both ends. Uh, to date, we have 22 million plus connected devices, uh, again, mostly across electric, but um, one to two million, uh, and, and increasing on the uh, smart cities, gas, water, and uh, and uh, IoT space side. Uh, we on the uh, on the analytics side, we have 20 million to 20 to 25 million devices that we're currently running analytics on. Some of which are on the existing footprint, and some of which are on uh, on other networks and customers that are they're using non-SSN networks. <clears throat> We have 200 billion plus record reads per year. Many of those devices are read multiple times a day. And at this point, 99.8% uh, SLA, SLAs on our uh, read performance is, uh, is a staple of our deployments. So that's SSN. So what are we here to talk about today? Um, as our customers are moving from 
the operational challenges of deploying these large geographic contiguous networks and deploying uh, electric meter or, or other types of endpoints. Uh, the collective attention is shifting away from, from those deployment efforts to what do I do with all this data that I now have access to uh, from these endpoints. So we're trying to address that and make it easier to make data available to various uh, groups within the organization as well as improve the data quality that you're getting from those devices and your networks and improve the flexibility of the data you can get off your network. So that's a key, uh, a key focus for us right now. Um, besides that, uh, integration complexity is a general challenge to analytics. So um, no matter how conceptually simple an integration may be, we know that those projects uh, take time, effort, and resources to move data from one location uh, to another and, uh, and do it securely and reliably. Um, and lastly, just coordination with various uh, silos of a business that may need similar data sets or the same exact same data sets and keeping some sort of standard across uh, across data access is another challenge that we are we're looking to help our customers address so how are we doing this um, uh, the next slide is just quickly a visualization of what I just talked through so to put in perspective related to our network uh, on the left hand side as the volume of devices on someone's network uh, increases, whether that be um, just more devices or different types of devices, um, as the velocity at which you're getting devices or excuse me data off those devices increase. So as we make this more flexible to get more granular data sets off of devices or potentially read devices at a more um, at a more regular pace, um, as that increases, and then lastly is the variety of data you're pulling off a network, whether it be different types of devices with different parallel app IoT applications, or whether it be um, different data sets off of your existing electric meter population. As the, all these things increases, increase, the downstream systems um, have an impact that occurs uh, to actually do something with that data. So your integration uh, effort would increase to push that data to uh, various distributed um, storage locations, and then also storage compute costs increase to house all that data and complexity to actually have applications that are going to then do something with that data increases. Um, so this is where we're currently at as our customers are moving forward with, uh, with these large-scale networks. Secondly, from a business standpoint, a lot of these different parts of an organization, uh, as I said before, need similar types of data uh, or the exact same data set, and uh, making that data available in a common and consistent and standard way um, is something we're striving to do, as well as um, presenting the data in a consistent uh, format and a consistent look and feel um, if and where we're building analytics dashboards or analytics projects with our customers is something that we want to address. So given all that, uh, we are moving forward with, we have the Silverlink data platform uh, that is now available to our existing customers. So um, I'm going to talk through very briefly uh, the three components that kind of stack up one on top of each other to, uh, to make this uh, data more accessible and more available to our customers. So this is our network, uh, this is our network diagram. It uh, includes silos across advanced metering, demand side management, distribution automation, and city infrastructure as you can see at the bottom. So we call all of that, that collective group of devices and network gear. Uh, our network platform. Uh, so that includes endpoints as well as relays and access points to collect all this data out in a large geographic, geographically contiguous area. So on top of that, we have a control platform, often called the head-end system. So the control platform is your system to provision, manage, access, uh, and, and regularly schedule reads and data access from those network devices. So the component that I'm focusing on today is a layer above that known as the data platform. So what we're, we've built is a large Hadoop cluster where we push that data from the network and from the head-end system uh, to a separate data storage, big data repository, uh, where our customers can now, can now access this data instead of having to pull that out of their, their head-end system. So as opposed to having many applications or many users across your organization, try to pull data out of a system that is specifically designed to run and manage a network and servers that are specifically um, devoted to that. 
we're pushing this to this, this large big data Hadoop cluster, making this data available for extended time periods, and it basically makes it available to both archive this data for long periods of time and also gather different and more granular data sets that would um, typically overrun a uh, standard enterprise uh, uh, data structure. So we're moving to, very briefly, a more uh, data-centric approach to application integration and analytics enablement. So what I talk about with that very briefly is that our data platform consists of uh, data ingestion, um, unpacking and making that data, storing that data in a standard format, and then both making uh, streams of real-time data off of the meter available, as well as uh, batch jobs and batch reads off the meter available via a standard and common suite of reports and APIs. So think about it this way, as opposed to taking data, pushing it through um, an IT back office, and then storing it in various disparate locations for your uh, CIS system, GIS system, um, what other, other partners you may be um, working with on energy efficiency or, or, that, or those sort of projects. Instead, um, we have a more data-centric approach where you have the option to use this data platform and just hand out API keys, um, access to this data, and folks can run and build their applications directly on this data platform. And so our, our desire here is to move to, to a more data-centric approach around, around these integration and uh, custom analytics projects. Now, admittedly, uh, a lot of our existing customers um, may not move to this immediately, and we may need to step into this um, because uh, you, don't change the, uh, you don't change the process overnight. But this is, this is where we want to head to. This is what we, the types of tools we want to make available to our customers and the direction that we'd... Um, you know, we choose to start working. At the same time, we're, we would uh, we realize that most of our customers have existing uh, big data strategies within their IT organizations, and we're we're looking to to dovetail in with those um, with the with the AMI data access where possible. Um, so this is where we come into the uh, Silverlink data platform for um, for both analytics and for partner integration. So briefly, I'm going to talk through next our integration with uh, Operations Optimizer. Um, now, Operations Optimizer was formerly Detectant, um, which was acquired a year, year and a half ago. And uh, so the integration, uh, in our integration, we use the data platform for analysis and storage of data, and Operations Optimizer is really where we do our analytics, heavy lifting, dashboarding, um, and that sort of thing. So. In our data platform, we would do data gathering, cleansing, and hypothesis testing. And what I mean by that is we would, we would take the data, store it in a common way, make it available, and then also allow people to do um, custom projects and hypothesis tes testing um, via either pulling uh, custom data sets out of this data platform or using um, a native ta Tableau integration <coughs> that we built in, which uh, allows you, for those of you that are familiar with Tableau, it's a, um, a BI tool that allows you to do um, various visualizations and geographic plots and that, and that sort of thing. Um, that being said, you're not limited to Tableau with the data platform. The API suite can be integrated with um, various other tools such as uh, MATLAB or R or anything. Pretty much any application at this point can consume RESTful APIs. Um, so you're not limited to that, but that's a uh, our integration that we've thoroughly tested and used to date. So Serlink Data Platform is your source for storing and, uh, and hypothesis testing. And then Operations Optimizer is really where we do our, our heavy analytics, workflow, alerts, notifications, dashboarding, that sort of thing. So when we get to a point where um, we feel like we fully vetted a problem, we see the business value, and we want to move this into um, into an actual operational process, this is where Operations Optimizer comes into play as a, uh, a, a custom and uh, a uh, flexible tool that we can use to build these dashboards that are very specific to our customers' needs and our customers' business. So next we're going to go into actually talking through, as opposed to architecture slides, a, a real use case um, where op Operations Optimizer team has worked with ComEd um, to do exactly that with meter transform mapping. And I'm going to pass it over to Mike Madrazo and Craig Cremian to talk through that. 
So over to you, Mike. All right, Craig, can you uh, hey give us uh, some background? Yep. So uh, you guys like a little bit of background. So uh, a ComEd, we are a, a electric utility in Chicagoland. We got about 4.2 million meters on our system. Uh, so a very large uh, old utility who is, uh, uh, like most utilities, struggled with some uh, data integrity issues and in some of our, our uh, systems and so forth. And so uh, this dates back to I'm a 25-year employee, and we've had uh, issues with a meter to transformer connectivity relationship models. So uh, um, with this, we went on many initiatives over the past 25 years to try to clean these up and fix these. Uh, unfortunately, though, they tend to be very labor-intensive, a drive out to the field, kind of do some validation and so forth. And so we never really made a lot of headway on it due to the uh, intense amount of resources it takes to, to do it that way. So, so basically we partnered up with, the, with uh, Mr. Madrazo's team and uh, his insight, and uh, we put that uh, problem out there, and we're, we've used uh, data analytics to solve that uh, problem. And uh, so uh, I think uh, Mike will go ahead and probably talk to a little bit of some of the different methodologies that we used uh, to try to, uh, so that essentially that what we're doing now is using data analytics uh, to make batch corrections to incorrect uh, associations uh, in our system, and uh, we feel we've been very, very successful with it. And uh, this provides great value to our customers because if we have this relationship wrong, we do things like uh, tell customers that they're out of power when they're not, if uh, based on uh, you know how we group them in our outage management system, uh, which really undermines your credibility with your customer, or or the same thing you tell them they've been restored when they haven't been restored. Um, so so really a, a big cust you know customer satisfaction issue as well as just a uh, resource utilization when you're sending people to the wrong to the wrong work based on this uh, uh, connectivity problem uh, between the data. And uh, so, so we're very happy with uh, the results of this. Okay, this is Mike Madronto now. I'll kind of go over the details. Craig and his team worked with uh, me and my team over a couple of years to uh, solve I, and the, the problem. As Craig just stated, it is you know you, you get the connectivity between meter and transformers key to the. So, <clears throat> as Craig stated the business challenge is that the connectivity model is key in many ways. It's, uh, it's used to identify outage through the outage management system. It's uh, key to communicating with customers and having the right connectivity model is really, uh, it's, it's critical in all planning activities as well. So, so as Craig said, it's an age-old problem at most utilities, also at ComEd. Um, so, so the solution really was to uh, solve the problem by what Charles is describing is tearing down the silos between departments and, um, and, uh, and then bringing it all together in one system, automating it, and, uh, and taking action. So, so we were fortunate, and this goes back to what Charles was talking about, <clears throat> you know, you have, having the data in one place in order to take on a project that covered many parts of the company, uh, we didn't need to go reinvent the wheel. So we already had um, systems and we already had AMI and CIS data flowing into this analytics platform in support of the AMI project, uh, AMI ops, RevPro, so it was being used by a lot of people. So really um, the, the, the project, you know, the beauty of the system is we needed a little bit more data in order to drive the system and we could just load it right in. So, so the addition of uh, GIS uh, data gave us uh, more connectivity from the transformer up to the substation. Outage data, which we'll get into a little later, supported one of the most effective methods that we implemented during this project. So really key, I'll, I'll trivialize, you know, getting all that data loaded and move on to the analytics. But really, you know, I would say that um, analytic or, or data is critical to analytics. If anybody's done analytics, you know, when you run 
some algorithm I attribute it to uh, finding a needle in a haystack. So every method is finding different needles. And inevitably, the first algorithm or analytic method you write finds bad data. And so you really need to get that data cleaned up. And, uh, and then also, as you're developing methods, you need to be aware that you can't clean all data. So your analytic methods need to account for potentially bad data. So, so our team got together with Craig's team and thought of, you know, and probably more coming from Craig's team to trying to solve this for 25 years. What are the possible things you've thought of and ways to detect that a meter is incorrectly mapped to a transformer? So we came up with distance is the obvious one. It's, you know, it's 10 miles away from the other transformers. And those, those are the easier ones, the 10-mile ones, but <clears throat> the closer ones are harder. Mismatches, you know, there's a lot of data in the billing system about the type of meter. We also get um, information about the transformer and especially the low side of the transformer and look for uh, incompatibility. So you have a, the ability, to, or we know it's not possible to have a three-phase meter and a single-phase transformer. So those sorts of things. So looking at those methods. Loading method, um, we found early problems where we had meters that were five, or transformers that were loaded, you know, 5,000 times their capacity. Part of that was bad data and bad capacity, and, and some of them were just large meters that were mismapped. And then missing method was just a, was trying to, you know, they, with all these siloed systems, they have to have coordination. And so, you know, the building system has one set of possible transformers, and GIS has another. And we had to figure out methods to clean up the, the ones that were missing from one system or another. And then the more uh, fun and exciting ones were the ones in the around AMI data. And so one of them, and you can see the picture in the front, is you know, live during the outage. So, so there's an outage um, that occurs on the transformer, and all the meters but one uh, lose power. Um, that, that one that didn't lose power didn't belong on that transformer. So finding those sounds simple, but, um, but that was a lot of work to get that right. And then voltage compared to transformer. And this has come into play in a lot of ways. Uh, this is how does the voltage of my meter correlate to the average of the other trans or meters attached to that transformer. So basically a virtual transformer meter. So these are all the methods we, we kind of came up with at the beginning and went down the path uh, to try out. So, so as I said, finding, uh, finding the ones that are mismatched is, is the relative easy part. Finding the correct one is, uh, is a bigger challenge. So, um, so we built a lot of tools. And when you see here in front of you, it will let you put in a transformer. And it shows you who's attached to me now and who I think, based on colors and shapes and things, who should, uh, should I be attached to. So we built a lot of tools. It wasn't just sitting and looking at data, but there was a lot of tools over the project to help us get this right. So really, um, the, the key to success of, of, uh, of any analytics project is, and as I say, you know, we're a data analytics company as well as a networking company, but the group that does analytics really relies on a partnership with our customers because we did over the course of this uh, this project did 700 field inspections and so we would try out a set of algorithms go to the field and say ah this is this is why this is why we're wrong um, you know this is why we're right and we adjust the models and we try it again so this went on over a long period six phases in the end and we found out a lot of you know things you, you wouldn't think in the office, or maybe you would, if, but we found it in the field, which is like, you know, the, the, um, all the other meters on the transformer had the same address inside of the street and things like that. So a lot of things got, a lot of things really got built into the, the suggestions over time. Probably the biggest was, the, you know, the voltage correlation. Someone advanced my slide there. Um, I'm going to go back. So probably one of the big ones is strong that we found. That, and these meters all happen to have voltage, but the meter, meter, the correlation of voltage with nearby transformers, so we, it turned out to be incredibly powerful. So I'm going to go into the results. So high, high level is uh, 
geocode data and, and how you handle it and how you validate it it was the most critical. Um, and I think I'll talk about this a little more. Mismatches, uh, that, that entire method, which was just matching of methods between the billing meter information about the billing system and, and, and uh, low side information about the transformer was uh, what we never could get good enough results, and you'll see that in a minute to really put that in production. And then other key that I'll touch on in a bit too is, is uh, AMI data was key to this. And we got the good results, which you'll see in a second, but much better with AMI. So this is a cryptic uh, chart, but it's it's powerful, and it, it talks about the beginning. So we were in the 30-40 percent success rate, and when we started out and similar on so mismatches finding the mismatch and then of those finding the right one so that was um, what we found in there is geocode was critical I mean we're only the design distance the maximum design distance for a typical North American um, meter from a transfer is at like 350 feet so if you if you don't have super accurate geocodes then you're not going to get that right so we went on to Lots of different methods of, of uh, using geocode qualities and different tools for getting geocodes, and we saw it dramatically improved results. Um, you can see the red lines of the methods we dropped at that phase. And then at the third, we decided to focus really just on AMI and one of the key pieces of data, at least on this project that we got from the AMI project, was uh, a lat long snap at the time of the meter set. So that and, and, and validating that uh, data against other data sources really increased our success up into the 90% uh, finding problems and 90% uh, and kind of over 90% on suggesting the right uh, uh, connection. So the recommendations I've touched on a little bit. We, are, we found uh, that uh, from kind of early tests that were about 6.7% of all the meters had a mismatch at comment, or actually maybe a little bit ahead of that once we implement the latest method. And, uh, but that number that number is not bad. So you sound, think that sounds bad, but um, we hear other utilities talking about up to uh, up to 20%. So the decision, and, and, and we really made this with Craig and his team, is is we could go change all the meters or correct all the meters now, but we would have some kind of the 80% the success on finding it, but only 50% on suggesting the right one. Or we could wait and move along with the, uh, with the AMI deployment over three and four years and get a much higher success rate, and that's what we decided to do. So, so the decision was to go forward and um, but we really wanted to automate this and, and, and make it kind of a set and forget process where where it just ran and you got a monthly report that tell, told you what was going on. So that's what we did. So the process is done monthly. Um, data is sent in the whole um, billing system extract and, and we get the outage data and the, and the connectivity model all comes once a month. All the analytics are automatically run. A log is kept in the analytics system of the changes that were suggested. It puts a file out that's picked up by IT that goes over and the bulk changes are made in the billing system. A new new batch of data comes. Those everything's logged in the analytics system. Which changes were made? Um, that, that we're most confidence was in the, uh, the live during outage method. So we. We go back and all the ones we use that method to validate that other methods were correct, and then we just get a monthly report. So this has been going on for about about seven, eight months now, and it's just kind of a set and forget. And I think we've uh, changed about 80,000 uh, problem connections. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about you know sort of what Charles said uh, philosophically at the beginning um, and, and how that ties back to this project of uh, how, how Silverlink really enabled this to happen in a rapid way. So the, the stack in the middle is basically you know, the, the sensors, devices, and data, data platform, and then applications on top. And what this points out is there's lots of data sources, both uh, from the devices but also 
from other places, billing systems, work order systems, things like that. So you stand it up, and, and in this case, I think we had to change two, two more data feeds. Probably all those ones on the right already existed, and we just added a couple data feeds. And, and previous to this project, many business functions were being served with the system on the left, and, and the SilverLink uh, solution then with a little bit more data and some smart people then built another business or use case that supported a business function. Now focusing on the uh, operations optimizer, which was one of the applications that happens to be a, a SilverSpring application, in order to license this, then we take many of those use cases and bundle them up into different analytics modules, and that's, and that's how it's really deployed. So this is kind of a parallel to the chart um, Charles had earlier with a bunch of X's between the lines. So we've now got a system in place, which is operations optimizer, but it's really the whole SilverLink solution that has automated data management, analytics, machine learning, all this workflow management and automation. And there's one system that's now broken down the silos across all the different organizations. And I think at ComEd now there's probably I don't know, 100 analytics users across maybe 15 departments using this system. But don't forget, don't forget all the partner networks. So then on top of that, so once you have this all stood up, then you know, the, the ecosystem of partners enables uh, you know, utility customers or smart city customers and then to go go add on and very rapidly, you know, add other applications that use the same data. So the takeaways, um, you've got quite a quite a an incredible data ingestion management and, and application enablement uh, solution in place. It, uh, Streams lines implementations, once you have it in place, you can tack on new use cases or, or partner apps very easily. And it's really kind of a unified experience, both from if you're using it to call APIs or as an end user with the applications. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. All right, thank you to all our speakers. Now we'll move on to the question and answer session. As a reminder, if you have a question and you haven't submitted it already, please use the Q&A box at the right of your window to do that. We have received lots of great questions already, and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the time we have remaining. Uh, the first question we have is going to go to Mike. Mike, which business functions are impacted most by errors in the connectivity model, and which will see the fastest return on investment after implementing an automated connectivity correction solution? Probably Craig, but I'll start with it. But really, I would say everything to do with outage. So outage detection, outage communication, you know, that's uh, it's, uh, utilities are, are measured highly on, on their performance and identifying and restoring outages, and so it's critical to that. The other function that benefits is, is anybody that's doing work on the system, so the planning functions rely heavily on having a good connectivity model. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the next question would be, um, can you implement an automated connectivity mapping solution with AMR or monthly data? Is that for Mike? Uh, yes, for Mike. I'll, I'll take that. So yes, and I think what our results showed, um, we could get up to 80% um, on identifying uh, improper connections, we, but of those, we were only about 50% right in picking the correct one. So, so it's still it's it's worth doing, and you can you can uh, really clean it up. You're gonna get it instead of um, having a, a, a meter that's on the wrong, not just the wrong transformer, the wrong uh, circuit feeder. You're going to at least get it close, so that's going to help. That's really going to help an outage anyway. So, but getting, you know, you, you you see transformers are often very close together, and getting the exact one. So, I would say it's a good solution for uh, monthly reads or AMR, and it's a great solution with AMR. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, for hey, hey, Mike, if, let me just uh, interject. This is Craig. Uh, so another uh, value proposition I think that just uh, recently emerged is uh, we're doing some stuff with uh, traffic lights and trying to prioritize them in our emergency response. So when we have storms, uh, to understand what traffic controllers are out of service and so forth. And a lot of these things are unmetered services for us. And so, uh, you know, no meter to tie them to. And so we really don't have any anything in our connectivity model or outage or our dispatch system to exactly like what they're fed off of uh, type of thing. And so, so we're, we're going to try to look into utilizing this because basically we can say, hey, well, get us a, a – you know, an address or a lat long of where the traffic controller's at, we can, you know, import it into uh, the system that Mike developed here, which, uh, and, and very quickly say, hey, boom, here's where we think that all these things are fed to, tie them into our connectivity model, and very quickly, uh, you know, be able to be much more responsive to our communities uh, by using this tool. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, as we go forward, you know, it's it's well thought out, and if we're going to find more and more uses for it. Thank you, Craig. Um, and I have another question. Um, so, for someone that is not already a Silver Spring Network AMI or Operations Optimizer customer, what additional steps are involved in setting up Operations Optimizer um, or an, an automated connectivity mapping solution? Charles, do you think you can help us with that one? Uh, Mike, I think that the sorry the connecting connectivity mapping solution one should go to you. I can cover the data platform pieces. I, I got it. So, so I think I showed four types of data that were required up there um, for this. One of them was the billing system, and there's a lot of information that's kind of the heart of a utility. One of them was AMI. Uh, in this case, we already had that, but you don't need that. So that so we talked about. So if you were an AMR or, or monthly, you could skip that. And then, and then it's some some information from the outage system and some information from the GIS system. Are there really four pieces? Um, so that it's not doesn't take you know it's it's uh, you know, the, this system like I said that um, that we used here has like over 30 million endpoints in it with a 20 something. Utility, so it was built to be flexible and really uh, load up in w load up in weeks, not years, like a lot of big IT projects. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we do have some more questions coming in. Uh, what are some examples of the data types um, accessible from the SilverLink data platform in real time? Yep, so I can talk uh, talk to that one. Um, so Silverlink Data Platform uh, pulls both batch data that you're uh, scheduling to pull off of your network as well as uh, enables real-time uh, data gathering on the NIC. We're actually enabling uh, custom logic and programming on the NIC itself for our users on their network. Um, so you can both, you can both gather data um, as expected normally, just batch over the network, or you can program your NIC to, to either uh, stream particular data sets or actually alert on specific business functions that are critical to you immediately in real time, be it uh, voltage sag swells, usage monitors, um, other power quality data like power factor, um, that sort of thing. So it will enable those data streams as well as um, you know, new, new devices. So as we roll on street lights and smart city devices, um, same thing. Uh, the reports and data that are getting pulled off that will get pulled over to the data platform and made available. Um, at the same time, we are building up some customer and internal mind share around our API suite of how we're accessing this data. So right now we've got some, uh, some specific APIs built to go after specific data sets and then some kind of overarching catch-all APIs to just go pull large data sets. Um, this, uh, this particular deployment in this, this large big data Hadoop cluster um, 
It's internally hosted by us, and we're on a six-week development cycle where we can do rapid changes and rapid development as we're getting feedback from uh, power users of this tool and new partners and new application and new custom projects that are rolling on. So we've really built this around um, being open, flexible, and, and making this um, uh, just rapidly available and scalable for our customer needs. Um, Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question about how um, you're changing the industry's current business model, which is mostly reacting to system problems and uh, start becoming proactive. Is there a process for that? So I can I can talk to that. This is Mike Madrazo. So I would say you know there the utility industry is changing dramatically. Um, you know it's it's been traditionally reactive. There's an entire uh, utility analytics institute that's been formed and it's growing. So so I, I, there's a lot of work going on all over utilities. We're involved in it in a lot of places to <clears throat> to have predictive models, and this is this project falls into that, I guess, and you know, where you're predicting connectivity problems, but transformer failure analysis, meter failure analysis. So there's a lot of, um, uh, the whole data science industry has met the utility industry, and, and there's you know, us and Silver Spring and, and several other vendors that uh, are really addressing that for the utilities, as well as it's very surprising to me, I go to these conferences now, and just about every utility has has some smart data scientists that's attending, and they may not have a lot of utility industry, but they're working with the domain experts at the utility to, to solve problems. So I think that the utility industry has changed dramatically in the last few years, and they've really embraced the data, data science and proactive versus reactive. Okay, thank you for that, yeah. Mike. Let me, this is Charles, let me add one more thing to that, um, and this is more around the, the data platform, data access size. One of the first things I hear from those data scientists uh, that I'm meeting at these uh, conferences is uh, a lot of the folks, when they roll on, um, spend weeks and months uh, simply trying to get access to large data sets um, when, they, when they join a new company, and uh, that feels like a lot of time wasted. And so making that easily available um, and accessible, um, frankly, just shaves off time in their, uh, their, you know, their time to be effective. Um, and I've got several examples that's where, of that where uh, some of our utilities have worked with local universities and to figure out how to just pass you know, massive amounts of terabytes worth of data back and forth versus just, hey, here's an API key. Go, go get the data yourself. We'll give you access, and you're off and running. Um, it seems, seems simple, but... Uh, Trying to be a little more forward thinking about that is part of what we're uh, we're working on. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, what uh, what other high value cases can you uh, use cases can you point to that are available on the operations optimizer? Uh, this is Mike, I can talk to that. So. So this project, I think, as I showed, there's a there's a, you think about uh, business functions or use cases. We happen to lump software into licensable modules, but really it's about use cases. And so they get lumped into this is falls into grid operations. There's a lot around um, you know network management, managing the AMI network and the meters, you know, that we, we lost as we got rid of meter readers, we lost the ears and eyes, so now we're having to do that in data, so there's lots of um, lots of benefit from using analytics because it can be overwhelming the amount of data that's coming back. The other areas um, that are high value um, in this and other projects, there's a, we have a lot of tools around revenue assurance, I mean, um, not just so that includes energy theft, but also just uh, losses from uh, metering errors, uh, uh, configuration errors, and things like that. So that one is very measurable and has a lot of benefits to a utility. And then, and then the fourth area we focus on is around customer programs using technology to help uh, better plan, um, deploy, and measure the success of different customer programs. So, there's a whole whole set of tools that include uh, 
system-wide disaggregation technology. So those are the four big groups, but within uh, within those groups, um, there may be you know 30, 40, 60 use cases that come in a bundle. So so m many many different valuable use cases. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, Charles, how do you guarantee security and prevent cyber attacks for the AMI AMR system? Yeah, good question. It expands a little uh, beyond kind of the, the analytics uh, focus here, but I can talk to it. Is um, So, SSN uh, security is extremely important for uh, our utility customers, obviously. So just as an organization, we have a uh, security committee uh, comprising um, security experts as well as uh, internally and in the industry and uh, representatives from uh, InfoSec groups at, uh, at some of our largest customers. Um, they meet on a regular basis um, to dictate some of our security policies and get feedback into that. We also do an annual penetration test of our network to um, try to find uh, find holes and issues or anything we can possibly with our own network. Um, we implement uh, security across many, many layers of our solution, um, whether it be peer-to-peer -peer network between devices in the field, um, device to back office, um, back office uh, servers in case of internal attack, that sort of thing. Um, we have security at all levels of our solution, and we just continue every year to um, look at our system, roll on new products, new solutions around um, making our making our end-to-end -end network more and more secure. Um, I will talk through some of the details as that's kind of customer confidential for our, around our network, but uh, it is a, a, getting data securely in and out of our networks and making our devices secure is uh, a huge, huge focus for our company. And the data platform itself, uh, where we're hosting customer data, as this data is an asset and is our customer's asset, we encrypt all this data at rest that we're putting in this platform. Um, we have secure APIs um, using uh, OAuth and uh, typical RESTful API architecture. Uh, and our customers actually have the ability to um, manage uh, who has access to that data and who doesn't. Um, so the control is on their side. Um, so every part of our solution has, uh, has that as a, as a major, major component. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Craig. Craig, our audience member has said, it sounds like ComEd is realizing significant operational benefits as a result of these efforts. Given that use of data analytics, uh, that use of data analytics can be an iterative and elusive process, are there any things you would have done differently to get there? No, that, that's a great, uh, great question, but I think the key thing is you have to select a good partner up front because they are iterative. Um, you know, so, so bridging that gap, uh, you know, with uh, IT and analytics, you know, technically virtually anything is possible. Uh, the big gap is trying to translate between the business and, uh, you know, the history of how your data uh, became what it came, your business processes that get it there or undo it, and then mashing that up with the, uh, uh, you know, the problem at hand and getting that into the technical solution. You know, that's the magic. Um, and, and fortunately for us, uh, uh, Mr. Madrazo and his team were, were great at that. Uh, very quickly, they would find issues with the data and bring things to it. We could, we could explain to them, oh, you know what, back 20 years ago, we went through this prop, we started doing this, so it, you know, it's probably that. And they, they very quickly could grasp our, our, uh, our business, our, our data, and our processes. And, uh, uh, without a lot of hand-holding and just take it, put it back in, they'd come to us and with a, you know, a new algorithm or tweak to the algorithm, spit out some examples, we'd go test it, um, and it worked out well. So, so I think that uh, um, that's the key. You're going to need to know that uh, uh, your data is going to have idiosyncrasies from 100 years of history and business processes and different things. And... Uh, uh, you're going to have to work close with them, so you can't you can't just dump this to the vendor and say, "Hey, give us one of these." Um, you're going to have to, you know, have a partnership and have and work with them. And if you do that, it you'll it was one of the most rewarding projects I've ever worked on. Um, so um, I think that was uh, that's the advice I'd give. Okay, great. Thank you, Craig. Good advice. 
Um, Charles, we do have another security-related question that I'd like to direct at you. Um, yep. Are you using a cloud-based data storage system, and how, how does that play with cybersecurity? Yep, so we are, we're not, we're, we're storing this all in our SSN data center. We're not storing this on AWS or something like that. Um, so all the customer data is, is in our data center where we're actually um, hosting quite a few of our uh, SaaS customers. We're already hosting their uh, head-end systems. Um, so in terms of our actual data platform architecture, a couple things we're doing. One, um, we're only pushing data. From, uh, from their head-end systems and network over to this platform. So it's only a one-way street right now um, pushing this data out. We have only a few ports open to do that. We are monitoring this constantly um, by our 24-7 knock. Uh, this data is in our data center. It is encrypted at rest with individual customer keys. And uh, as I said before, we're using uh, a, management, uh, a management console that our customers are using to manage API access as well as um, you know, standard OAuth authentication and that sort of thing. And then uh, at the same time, all data in transit is also encrypted in transit. Um, so, but, but key point there, we are, we are not storing this outside of uh, our SSN data center. Okay, thank you. Um, now, if someone already has a Silver Spring network, What's involved in deploying an application from the Silverlink App Store? Yeah, I can talk to that uh, quickly. So uh, I think I called this out briefly, but uh, coming back to that data-centric architecture. So once we have uh, the platform in place, um, so that's the network plus this data platform in place, um, I think in the past, no, I think in the past, I know in the past, uh, Giving access to your head-end system where people have access to run whatever data they want out of your head-end systems or out of your network is not something that uh, anyone is overly keen to, uh, to do, which is the right call. So pushing this data out to the data platform uh, obviously separates it from the head-end system, and it's as simple as giving an API key to one of the partner applications or to um, someone internally at your company that you want to allow to have access to this data to run their own analytics operations. Um, so once this platform is in place, it's just that simple. And as I said before, um, we're going to keep evolving this API suite as new partners roll on, as a new kind of mind share evolves with our customers that are using this platform. Um, to keep refining these APIs to match the need. So um, once it's in place, it becomes, uh, becomes much more simple than uh, spinning, up a, spinning up a project or, uh, or having to pass across a, a physical USB or a uh, piece of data or whatever it might be. All right. Thank you very much. Um, regarding um, those apps, does the SmartLink data platform work with other types of intelligent devices, and can data be collected for smart city apps? Yeah, so I called out earlier, the, uh, anything that's collected off our network, um, we kind of have a general catch-all file system, and uh, we'll be evolving um, some of those APIs to go to be more specific to smart city and other types of application. Frankly, a lot of our APIs right now are really focused on AMI electric load profile data, and then um, other pieces of data we just have open kind of catch-all catch-all file drops for. Um, but absolutely, anything riding on our network, if we're pulling a, a report or a read off it, we will be pumping it into this data platform. So, in short answer is yes there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it uh, would appear that our time is winding down. We do have time for one last question, however, and that is what types of data analysis and visualization can be performed with the Silverlink data platform? So Mike, or, I can talk through uh, some of our Tableau and BI integrations, but do you want to talk through OO uh, and data start. analysis and visualization just, why first? Why don't you just start what's kind of, why don't you, so Charles will kind of describe what, what comes out of the box uh, with, with uh, the data platform. Yep. And then I, I can so, go from there. Great. So we have, a, uh, we have a Tableau integration, as I called out earlier, and to start with, um, 
we have developed a series of standard Tableau reports related to electric metering, you know, things like um, energy delivered versus received, voltage sag swells, um, usage reports, that sort of thing. Um, so we have, we have a Tableau integration, some standard reports, and our customers can have the ability to access these data sets in a Tableau format, um, uh, assuming that uh, they've got a Tableau license. Now, to actually just go view reports that we've created off of their network that are just standard, um, Tableau, like Adobe, Tableau Reader is, is free uh, to go download so you can consume those reports. So we're working with some of our first few customers on um, using those and getting some feedback around, uh, around the form of those reports. So Tableau integration is, uh, is kind of our focus BI tool of choice. That being said, um, as I called out earlier, the, the flexible set of APIs are well documented, will be available to our customers so that they can access their data. And I myself, um, I myself have gone ahead and run uh, MATLAB, uh, gone and hit those uh, APIs out of, out of MATLAB and done some of my own visualizations and data analytics there. Um, I think someone else had run some Python scripts and .NET scripts and that sort of thing to go build their own visualizations. So the API suite makes it flexible to integrate with the BI tools that are your tools of choice, but um, we have a lot of um, focus around Tableau visualizations. And then Mike, I know in OO you guys do a ton of this as well. Right. So I think what Charles showed in a kind of a Chevron diagram earlier is that the data platform kind of takes it to the point of the hypothesis testing through Tableau or other tools you might want to use. And then, and then if you want to um, take it to the next level of analytics or workflows or dashboarding, then yeah, the product operations optimizer comes into play. And, and but it's using all the same API calls that, that would be used by a customer. So, so you get these hundreds and hundreds of predefined use cases and maps and things like that. So there's lots of data visualization, more, more from a, um, you know, a, an operational standpoint than an exploratory, although, although there's lots of tools to dig into the data and explore. But, but typically you would use Tableau to to just explore, and then when you want to put something in operations or go deeper into analytics, then you'd add, add on operations optimizer. Thank you for attending this fierce live webinar and submitting so many thoughtful questions. I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and Silver Spring Networks for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded. You will be able to access the recording within 24 hours on the same page you used to register for this event. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integrated Analytics to Power Critical Utility Operations, presented by Silver Spring Networks. I'm Barbara London, Editor-in-Chief of Smart Grid News, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Charles Fisher, Director of Business Development, Silver 